Chapter 1, Unusual Circumstances October 21st, 2.47 a.m. At approximately 11 p.m., a civilian reported an unidentified body discovered on the side of the road and called for an ambulance. The patient was bleeding profusely from six abdominal puncture wounds, whose spacing implies that all six wounds were inflicted simultaneously, most likely a goring incident by a cervid pair of antlers. Patients sporadically regained consciousness in the ambulance, but did not provide identification. Patient appeared to be unable to hear the EMTs, and gave only cryptic remarks that most likely stemmed from near-death hallucinatory experiences. Upon arrival at the hospital, the patient was rushed to the OR and died on the table due to blood loss. As chief medical examiner, the body was transferred to my care to provide identification and issue a death certificate. The case piqued my interest, so I set to work right away. The remainder of this entry comprises my notes regarding this case. Bullet point one. Young adult male, approximately mid-twenties. Canine. Species estimated to be Lotrans, Familiaris, or most likely both. Identifying features include an opaque cloudiness, likely some sort of congenital blindness, over the right eye, and a blue-tinted coat with two different shades of brown underbelly along the ventral axis, a saddle marking in black, and several white diamond-shaped markings along the body, one in the center of the forehead, one above each eye, one dorsal marking between the shoulder blades that aligns with one ventral marking over the sternum, and one under the chin traveling about midway down the ventral side of the neck. Patient also has age-unrelated white markings on the muzzle, tail tip, and paw digits. Bullet point two. Patient was wearing nothing but a small red hoop earring, which is proving extremely difficult to remove. I'll have to come back to it later with more powerful tools in order to return it to the individual's family, but for now, I don't want to risk damaging any potential evidence or personal property that the family or investigators might want. Bullet point three. Vitals were recorded to confirm the surgeon's proclamation of death. The body lacked a pulse and no breathing was observed. Photographic documentation and measurements were taken of each puncture wound and the body overall. Bullet point four. Six entry wounds were recorded and measurements of each were charted on a diagram that can be found in the patient's case file. In addition to lacking exit sites, the diameter, depth, and placement of the puncture wounds confirm the theory that they were all inflicted at once by cervid antlers. The wounds are placed in a tight arc along the ventral side of the upper abdomen. At a glance, one appears to have punctured the heart, and ruptured lungs are also to be expected. Bullet point five. Upon further examination, the heart does not appear to have been punctured and, bizarrely, could not be located by simple probing of the wound. Furthermore, despite the copious amounts of blood, the flesh surrounding the interior walls of each puncture wound appears to be undisturbed, as if the flesh had simply molded around the weapon as it entered. Only the skin is punctured, and not one interior blood vessel seems to have been severed during the trauma. Severed surface vessels alone would not explain the amount of blood loss recorded by hospital staff. I suspect the body may have been tampered with, although it's highly improbable that such a thing would be possible between the OR and my examination table, and an incredible level of surgical skill would be required to render the flesh in this way. Bullet point six. A standard Y incision was made to open the abdomen and examine the internal organs. What I observed on the inside was baffling. All major internal organs were present, but arranged bizarrely inside the abdomen. Additionally, the patient possessed what appeared to be underdeveloped forms of organs that are impossible for genus canis to possess. Some, such as this, what appears to be a minuscule swim bladder, aren't even typical structures for mammalia. The arrangement of the internal organs was also documented in a diagram on file for this case. Again, the best explanation is tampering even with the lack of evidence of any outside agent attempting to open the body. Regarding the bizarre arrangement, the organs appear to have simply grown this way, although that is clearly impossible. This degree of abnormal placement is far beyond the scope of some inherent mutation and warrants a full investigation as a first-degree murder case with probable dismemberment involved. Bullet point seven. Each organ was weighed, and samples of each were taken for pathological examination. I collected multiple samples of blood, which seemed to behave strangely, more like mercury than what I'd expect of true blood. Furthermore, it didn't seem to coagulate properly, 
which I noted as potential hemophilia on the patient's medical history form, along with the slew of other abnormalities. Something about the luster of this blood looks entirely off, but maybe that's just an observer error due to sleep deprivation. Bullet point eight. Figuring I should wrap things up for the night, I recorded the dental history, quite clean, no major work done, and took a nose print for identification purposes. I sent off the unidentified decedent form, so investigation can begin on the legal end, and I'll return to the medical mysteries of this case in the morning. October 22nd, 9.35 a.m. Today, I continued my examination of the unidentified antler goring case from last night. The following are my observations. Bullet point one. I prepared microscope slides of the organ tissue samples and carefully examined each to look for evidence of the possibility that any of the organs were introduced to the body via tampering. On the contrary, each tissue sample possesses an organelle type in its cell structure that's unknown to me, but demonstrates a clear continuity within the entire corpse that makes me certain that they all belong to the same individual. The skin, bones, and muscle tissue appear to have large amounts of this unknown organelle. Bullet point two. I took some additional blood samples and attempted to sequence the patient's DNA to find some answers about this individual's unusual morphology. However, PCR methods were ineffective because the DNA strands could not be separated by the normal procedure of thermal cycling. I'll try some other methods as well and do some research into other sequencing techniques available to me. Bullet point three. Lastly, I've uploaded the patient's profile info onto an online database of unidentified bodies, and I've been told that the local paper and news station both ran a segment this morning requesting information from the public. Not that many people actually read or watch either of those these days, but hopefully someone comes forward with some information soon. On a personal note, this is my journal after all. I'm not sure I've ever been so impatient for clues before. I'm dying to get to the bottom of this case. October 25th, 5.23 p.m. Still no luck with sequencing the DNA. It appears to be extraordinarily heat resistant, and even methods used to sequence the genomes of extremophile bacteria are completely ineffective here. No matter the method, this DNA simply can't be separated. It just doesn't want to be read, evidently. Likewise, none of my research can explain the mystery organelles in the tissue samples either. I've sent some of the sample slides from the liver, kidney, blood, and dermis over to an expert pathology lab for analysis, but I'm not optimistic, which is pretty abnormal for me. Finally, since no one has come to claim the body, I ran a little research of my own. I scoured both local and national databases for missing animals cases that match the patient's physique, which of course also came up inconclusive. There was a case or two that came close but lacked the distinctive diamond markings that this patient has. I even searched through birth records, but that might be a bit too ambitious for me to survey alone. A full investigation is now underway to identify this mystery individual and uncover the circumstances that led up to their death. I hope someone finds some answers soon. I can't imagine what the family will think of all this. October 26th, 1.37 a.m. This case appears to be haunting me. Not only have I had dreams about it, but even in my daily life, this mystery never ceases to nag at my brain. Without any new information, all I can do at this point is wait, but I can't help but wonder, who was this individual? What leads someone to getting stabbed by a six-point buck before dying on the side of the road with a whole menagerie of organs crammed into their body cavity? Reading back over this, I can't even believe it. When I became a medical examiner, I knew I'd see some strange and even some distressing cases. But this... Is this even real anymore? Am I dreaming? Surely someone's playing tricks on me. October 27th, 3.52pm. Good news. The pathology lab finally got back to me about the tissue samples. Bad news, they don't know what those organelles are either. It couldn't be matched with any recorded disease or phenomenon known to canines, and appears to be an evolutionarily distinct feature. 
not just a simple mutation. So then, does that mean the patient isn't canine at all? Beyond that, are they even a mammal? The final comment of that report was the most confusing, but also somehow comforting in its validation of my own frustrations. It explained that their lab had also attempted to sequence the DNA of these tissue samples, only to come up blank. They weren't even able to identify a taxonomic order. I know my career is still young, but I truly haven't seen anything like this before. Without observing these cells in a living state, we can't be certain what the function of that organelle even is, let alone where else one might normally find it. Another piece of the case gone cold, I guess. I need to get back to other work, but I probably won't be able to shake these questions from my mind for the rest of the day. A new organelle in a potentially new distinct species? That's something you don't see every day. October 27th, 10, 12 p.m. I didn't expect to write another entry today, but here we are. Today is full of surprises, it seems. On that note, I don't know who I expected to come forward with information about the mystery patient, but I certainly didn't expect them to meet me on the sidewalk on my walk home from work. Around an hour ago, a young woman stopped me suddenly. She boldly interrupted my audiobook with her palm held out in front of her, stopping me in my tracks. If it weren't for her long white ears suddenly sticking straight up in front of my face, I probably would have completely glanced over the small rabbit in front of me. I'd never seen her before in my life, but she seemed to know exactly who she was looking for. She introduced herself as some follower of so-and-so, some name I didn't recognize, though I had a feeling it was something more outlandish than your everyday politician, given her grandiose tone. Indeed, she claimed that her infernal patron was being held prisoner by me, that she'd seen the request for information on the news and was here to provide. She warned me that if I didn't release this demon lord in three days' time, that I would witness something truly frightful and henceforth become cursed. I had to bite the inner corner of my jowls to keep from laughing, but still did my best to ask in a polite, genuine tone if she had any more information for me. Still, she realized I wasn't taking this as seriously as she was, and gave me a small pamphlet that appeared to have been handmade just to sway my opinion. This demon lord might as well be a politician after all, it seems. It included some pretty detailed illustrations, as well as some laughably lofty titles. Prince of Demons, King of Diamonds, Cambion of Clairvoyance, etc. Honestly, it was fairly well detailed. It even includes a couple of prayers or summoning rituals or something like that. I didn't read it all that closely, so my memory's failing me here. Anyways, although I can appreciate the effort she put into it, I still couldn't take it seriously. This is a real murder case, after all. After handing me the pamphlet, she begged me to see the body, which I of course declined on the grounds that only family members of the deceased could do something like that, certainly not followers. She then started talking to me about how they were family by pact, at which point her intensity started to get more and more unnerving. I thanked her for the very informative pamphlet and quickly excused myself from the conversation, hurrying home. Now that I'm home, I'm kicking myself for not getting her name so I can warn the security staff not to let her into the morgue unless she brings proof of relation. Oh well. At least I have this one name from the pamphlet. Came, was it? Maybe I'll do a little research, just to entertain myself. October 28th, 3.01 a.m. Can't sleep. I keep feeling a chill wash through the room. I hope my heating didn't break again. October 28th, 5.10 p.m. Even though I didn't sleep much last night, work has been smooth today. At this point, I've been focusing on my other cases, but things were really slow today, and the endless riddles of the mystery case never left my idle daydreaming. Everyone else even left early, so I've had plenty of time alone with my thoughts to consider all the possibilities. It would be nice to solve a big biological puzzle like that again. I haven't done a real research project in so long. Maybe once the legal side of this case is all cleaned up and the patient's been identified, I could ask the family of the deceased about doing a case study on this interesting condition they seem to have. 
Maybe they'd even have some information about the deceased's life that could explain at least some of my observations. But for now, it's just me and the corpses in the morgue, and it's up to me to tell their tales and help them find peace. Still, in the meantime, filling a couple of IV bags with extra blood samples couldn't hurt, could it? October 28th, 11.16pm. My naive curiosity got the better of me. I looked up some information on this came figure. Even after telling myself again and again that there's no point in looking at all these lies crafted to scare pups into behaving. I'm not sure why I never threw out that pamphlet, but I saw it on my desk and pulled up that name again. When I dug into it, I uncovered some folklore and even some old medieval manuscripts listing noteworthy demons. Oddly enough, the drawings in this pamphlet, and even the ones in those faded manuscripts, as weird as it sounds, they do kinda look like him. <laughs> 